So this week marks five years since the World Health Organization officially declared COVID-19 as a global pandemic. And joining us today is a Vancouver physicist and biochemist who played a key role in the team that developed the mRNA delivery technology for the COVID vaccines. Peter Collis is a professor in the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology at UBC. His new work includes therapeutics to treat cancer and other diseases. So we mark this progress today at a time when the United States is cutting funding for vaccine research. Dr. Peter Cullis, a very good afternoon to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, thanks for having me. So what do you remember about just where we were at five years ago, March 2020? Um, it was a strange sort of situation. I, I'd, I'd been down to, I was in New York and I was giving a talk at Pfizer Pharmaceuticals, and um, <clears throat> the uh, which was long planned. And uh, it was a Usually when you go to a big pharmaceutical company to give a talk, you end up talking to other scientists. Uh, but in this particular case, it seemed like all of the vice presidents and so on uh, were in attendance, uh, which was unusual. Um, and uh, I didn't really realize that they were then considering uh, taking the lipid nanoparticle mRNA uh, COVID-19 vaccine forward. Um, so we only found out about that a little bit later, but I guess the reason I was being examined was because of, you know, there was in the process of making that decision, which of course was a billion dollar decision. You know, we got uh, back to Vancouver and I think three days later, the, um, <clears throat> the whole country shut down. So it was an interesting time. Well, it was. Okay. So tell me more about this in, in, in the way that you and your team contributed to this this pivotal COVID mRNA vaccine. This is a long story. It could take... Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cole's notes. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it really goes back about 40 years. I mean, I, I've been working on, uh, on lipids in biological membranes for that length of time. Uh, but in order to look at the, study these these uh, components, it's far too complicated in a biological membrane. So you have to make simple systems. They're called model systems. Well, it turns out those are lipid nanoparticles, and we found we could load drugs into them. This was in the middle '80s, and then in the middle '90s, we said, okay, if we can uh, deliver small molecule cancer drugs, perhaps we can deliver much larger molecules, which are the nucleic acid uh, <coughs> nucleic acids used for the vaccines, for example. And so we found ways of doing that. We collaborated with a company in Boston called Al Nylum for about seven years uh, to develop one of the first drugs that's ever <clears throat> never been approved by the FDA to treat a rare disease. That was about 2012. That got approved in 2018. And in the meantime, one of the companies that I'd founded had uh, founded a, <clears throat> a, a collaboration with BioNTech to work on a flu vaccine. And uh, that... Um, of course, in January, February of 2020, uh, to heck with doing the flu, uh, let's go for the COVID vaccine. So that's really how it all, you know, that was a Coles Notes version, that's for sure. Well, we're, well thank you. <laughs> I, I, I got it. It was It's an amazing history, really. So so how, how life-changing was that discovery, just in terms of the impact on the pandemic? Um, well, obviously, it was huge in terms of the pandemic. I mean, the... Uh, the, I think it was November 2020 when the results of the uh, trial came out and it was 95% you know, effective for preventing, co preventing uh, you know, SARS-CoV-2 or the, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so, um, yeah, that, uh, I think they were saying they were going to get 1.5 billion doses made in 2021. That was actually getting closer to 3 billion and another 3 billion the year after. Uh, so, yes, it was uh, been in billions of people's arms. So life-changing is a mild way of putting it. Okay. What about for you personally? How, how life-changing was it Was it for you? Well, the, um, I'm like many scientists. You know, you work away on something because you find it interesting. And uh, the uh, yeah, and also very necessary. I mean, that we have to get cancer drugs much more specifically to where they're needed, as opposed to all over your body and making your hair fall out and all the rest of it. So that's one objective. And the other was, why do we use small molecules? Well, because they're the only ones that can get inside cells to actually do something. Okay, well, maybe we should get some bigger molecules, and that's you know, like nucleic acids, and then use the same. 
you know, basically the same processes that your body uses, that biology uses uh, to be able to treat disease. So it's a very powerful, you know, it really is a very powerful approach. Okay. So tell me more about this. This uh, you, didn't, you didn't get into how it affected you, you personally. Does, does it, do, do people, or are people more likely to answer the phone? Do you get that appointment right away? <laughs> I mean, roll out the red carpet for Dr. Cullis? Yeah, well, it, it, as I say, there was a lot of us working in this area. It was a relatively, what's the best way, way to put it, um, um, certainly unknown, uh, you know, I mean, relatively fringe kind of activity. I mean, a lot of science is like that. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, uh, after um, being in this field for, you know, as I said, 30, 40 years, uh, <clears throat> we hit, we hit, uh, we call it the big time. And that was, so that was certainly, you know, that certainly made a huge difference in terms of uh, the recognition, uh, the, uh, <clears throat> the, uh, you know, we all we all do our whatever we do, and then you know it's it's amazing when something happens of the of that magnitude where, uh, you know, something you're working on for for a good length of time um, <clears throat> because you think it's really important uh, actually does become quite important and becomes recognized by other people. In 2018, I don't think anybody knew what a lipid nanoparticle was, and then all of a sudden. You know, uh, uh, a, a lot of people do. Even my wife knows what a lipid nanoparticle <laughs> is now. So <laughs> It's rolling off our tongue. So uh, how will lipid nanoparticles uh, contribute to the what's being described as a, a revolution in cancer treatment? You just you alluded to it just a few moments ago, but can you tell us more? I think it's going to be a revolution in pretty much area of any <clears throat> all areas of medicine. Um, in cancer treatment, the... Um, the uh, what we're re- starting to realize now that uh, you know we obviously we we have surgery chemotherapy etc as primary treatments, uh, but really getting your immune system to uh, to take a cancer seriously is is really the you know going to be the main the main treatment of the future. Ninety um, percent of all cancers happen after the age of fifty, and that's after your immune system starts to go downhill a little bit. Well, not just a little bit, a lot. And anyway, so the um, the cancer vaccines, where you basically uh, <clears throat> have messenger RNA that codes for, uh, say, a protein that's on the outside of a virus, uh, or or on the outside of a cancer cell, uh, <clears throat> then you can engender a, an immune reaction to the cancer itself, and you can personalize this in a very direct way. So. Do a biopsy, find the, the proteins that are where there's mutations, and then find those the particular parts of that protein that are particularly immunogenic or will cause an immune response, and then you code for those those peptides, as they're termed, uh, in a messenger RNA that might be coding for 20 or 30 of them, and um, it's having quite remarkable effects in pancreatic cancer, uh, lung cancer, melanoma. We're starting to see big advantage advances all over the place. Wow, this direct delivery. Yes. It's direct delivery. Okay, this it's exciting. It is very it's exciting. And I, exciting, I, I yes. applaud I applaud the thirty or forty years that you have put into this. <laughs> I really do. And 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 my my heart just sinks when I see the news out of the the u s j- just this week, the, the the u s. Health Secretary Robert Kennedy, he has directed the the National Institutes of Health, the NIH to to terminate dozens. <laughs> of research grants into vaccine hesitancy, now taking aim at at projects that that involve mRNA vaccines as well. How damaging is this to the scientific community? Uh, It's it's damaging. Uh, You know, I have a lot of friends, obviously, in the U.S., a lot of scientific uh, friends who are scientists, and uh, the the mood is not good. Uh, They're they're feeling um, attacks for things that are they're doing that are obviously a great benefit to uh, a large number of people. So it's it's really demoralizing. And um, how do you turn the corner on that? It's uh, it's difficult to say. I mean, I think. One of the things will be when, okay, it's one thing to have a vaccine for the flu or whatever. Um, the it'd be another thing to have a, a vaccine that if you get cancer, it brings you, it basically cures you. I think those sorts of things will start to turn the tide as you really see the benefit, the very, very direct benefit uh, in diseases that would normally be fatal. But when you see this direction um, in the United States right now, does it have an effect on on your research on anything that is going on in Canada right now too? Uh, not right now. Um, no, the uh, the effect is really being felt. Well, unless you hold an NIH grant, for example, then you probably are in trouble. Uh, but uh, and some of my colleagues do. Uh, but um, for me directly at the moment, no, it's not affecting things. Um, the um, oh, it's it's staggering what's happening south of the border. 
what are what are your biggest concerns about? You know, you're, you're saying at some point when they see the vaccines work for for cancer, for example, but in in the meantime, in terms of the the, the potential um, effects. Yeah, well, the, the, it's it's a strange time because uh, the um, you know obviously science has had you know major benefits not just for curing disease, etc. Um, but we seem to be in an age now where experts are not exactly uh, viewed as being uh, you know the, the uh, the, the favorites, uh, you know, politically we see we seem to be uh, in, uh, in in not a good in not a good position. Uh, somehow or another, we had to work our, work our way out of this. That uh, experts aren't viewed with suspicion. That there's ulterior motives, et cetera, et cetera. So. Are, are you optimistic? We'll we'll get there. Oh, I'm always optimistic, uh, but uh, you know you can't <laughs> you can't give up on these things. But uh, it, it is it is a very it's not just science. I mean, there's so many areas that are. Uh, really under threat at the moment, and um, it's a uh, yeah, it's a real. I don't know. the The next three years is or four years is uh, you know. Let's let's hope we hang on for that length of time, and then hopefully things will change. Well, I know that you have received uh, personally and, and your team as well um, international recognition, Canadian recognition as well for 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 this discovery. You you've actually been touted as a future Nobel Prize laureate. <laughs> how, how do you feel about about your name being bandied about in that realm? Um, well, you know, obviously, you, you you feel the first thing you feel. I mean, I the, I'm like you know most scientists. We we're highly collaborative, and so uh, I I mean, there's been literally hundreds of people I've worked with over the years, and that, that uh, have contributed to you know whatever we've achieved. So really, it's a, a team effort. I think we'll say one thing. I, the uh, Canadian science is second to none, and uh, so it's a uh, you know we should feel kind of proud of what we've you know, achieved scientifically, not just in this area but many others. It's really a pleasure to meet you. Thank you again for for coming in, and uh, and congratulations on all you've been able to accomplish. Well, thanks, Gloria. That's Peter Cullis, a professor in the Department of Biochemistry, Molecular Biology at UBC. He played a key role in the team that developed the mRNA delivery technology for the COVID vaccines. Uh, This week marks five years since the COVID pandemic.